Good morning. It's great to be together, even when we are physically apart. I hope you had an opportunity for a break over Easter. I had a lovely few days seeing friends and family I hadn't seen for such a long time. I'm loving hearing your feedback from our 24-7 prayer week during Holy Week. Please do keep sharing as we build up a rich and wonderful picture of what God is saying to us. Our joint PCCs and team council met on Tuesday and overwhelmingly voted to move forward with our proposal for a lay post in the team. And we will keep you updated with how that discernment progress process progresses. If you haven't before, why not join us with our daily morning prayer during the week, led by our diverse group from across the team, accompanied by beautiful images created by Neil and Kristen Kemsley. You can find that further down our services page. But for now, I'll hand you over to Simon, who will lead us and encourage us to fan the flames of resurrection in our communities. Hello and uh, welcome. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. You are the King of glory. You are the Prince of peace. You are the Lord of heaven and earth. Son of righteousness, angels bow down before you, worship and adore, for you have the words of eternal life, you are Jesus Christ the Lord. Hosanna to the Son of David, Hosanna to the King of kings. Glory in the highest heaven, for Jesus the Messiah reigns. You are the King of glory, you are the Prince of peace. You are the Lord of heaven and earth, you are the Son of righteousness. Angels bow down before you. Worship and adore, for you have the words of eternal life. You are Jesus Christ the Lord. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna to the King of Kings. Glory in the highest heaven, for Jesus the Messiah reigns. Hosanna to the Son of David, Hosanna to the King of Kings. Glory in the highest heaven, for Jesus the Messiah reigns. So we come to our confession where we say sorry to God. In baptism, we died with Christ so that as Christ was raised from the dead, we might walk in newness of life. Let us receive new life in him as we confess our sins in penitence and in faith. Father, we have sinned against heaven and against you. We are not worthy to be called your children. We turn to you again. Have mercy on us and bring us back to ourselves through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins. Heal and strengthen us by his spirit and raise us to new life in Christ, our Lord. Amen. Glory to God, 
Glory to God, glory in the highest. Glory to God, glory to God, glory in the highest. To God be glory forever. to Christ Jesus. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to Christ Jesus. To God be glory forever. To God be glory forever. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Amen. Glory to God, glory to God. Glory to the Spirit. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to the Spirit. To God be glory forever. To God be glory forever. Hallelujah, Amen. And so we come to the collect for this day. Risen Christ, faithful shepherd of your father's sheep, teach us to hear your voice and to follow your command that all your people may be gathered into one flock to the glory of God the Father. Amen. The first reading is from Acts chapter 4 verses 5 to 12. The next day their rulers, elders and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, Alleluia. Go and make disciples of all nations, says the Lord. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Alleluia. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John, chapter 10, verses 11 to 18. Glory to you, O Lord. I am the Good Shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, 
because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Hello. Today we're looking at fanning the embers of resurrection in our local community. Now I remember a discussion in, in one of the churches that I've ever seen along the way as to whether we should enable the village in which that church was situated to open a fair trade shop in the church building. Now this village church uh, was an excellent church, brilliantly forward-thinking uh, in Christian spiritual ecology, for example, and was interconnected to the fair trade movement in the area through the members and the leaders of the church. This connection with the fair trade movement was important, uh, while it was important on a local and global community service level, of course, but also, significantly, this connection was important on a spiritual level. Fair trade uh, then and now expresses a spiritual ethic, the ethic that each and every worker, indeed each and every individual in the world, is bestowed with dignity. And that dignity should be honoured in the way that they receive reward for their production of goods, especially if they extend that dignity to their clients and their employees through their ethical business practices. Looking at this through the Christian lens, we can see here the global repercussions of loving our neighbour fanning out uh, from the sustained purchase of fair trade goods. And this ethical shopping practice revolves around the spiritual premise that each worker, indeed each individual on the earth, is a child of God because they come from God and accordingly they have immeasurable dignity bestowed upon them. Now I think in retrospect uh, we should have moved the discussion forward around the proposal of a fair trade shop in the church by starting with this spiritual outlook. But inevitably the initial preoccupation prevalent in those days, this was a while back, was whether a shop in a church would allow a money changes in the temple scenario to ensue in the church. Now those of you who heard our teaching on the temple incident in John chapter 2 back in March will know that Jesus' concern at the temple in Jerusalem was actually not about trading permissions. His concern and disgust was about temple injustices to the poor, extortionately ripping them off in God's name in enforced fees and taxes. So, my sense is, had the discussion about that fair trade shop in that church started with the spiritual search of the villagers in which the church was located, a spiritual search galvanised by their spiritual worldview that foresaw dignity and justice for workers and employees around the planet through fair trade practices. If we'd done that, then I think the answer may well have been yes to taking the shop project forward. For surely the church's calling is to identify the seed of resurrection in the local community, the seed of Christ's triumphant love and justice, witnessed in this case in his powerful impetus to love thy neighbour rising up in that community. Our calling is to identify the seed of resurrection in the community that is beginning to rise up and then nurture that seed until it grows to such a radiance that it illuminates its source. Now to understand our scripture for today from Acts 4, we're particularly looking at the nature of the church in the Acts of the Apostles uh, in these post-Easter talks. To understand our scripture, it's important to see the momentum that runs through the scripture. The book of Acts was written by Luke, the same guy who wrote the Gospel of Luke, 
And he wrote both by taking historical events and shaping them and weaving them together to communicate his message. A message that we now believe is a primary source through which God speaks to us. At this point in the Acts of the Apostles book, Luke is concerned with prophecy, the foretelling of the great message of the triumph of love and justice and eternal life over evil, injustice and death in the world, supremely seen in Christ's resurrection for the dead. And Luke is particularly concerned about the momentum of that prophecy, i.e. that that momentum will continue. That momentum is, is first documented by Luke uh, by him spotlighting John the Baptist's prophetic role in foretelling of the coming Messiah and the deliverance from evil, injustice and death that the Messiah will bring. Then Luke moves on to Jesus' succession of John the Baptist in this prophetic role. He, uh, Jesus, who was anointed by the Holy Spirit to proclaim this deliverance, not least to a particular group of people, those who are outcasts, i.e. those who are outside the historical people of God, those indeed who have been considered not dignified enough to be in this people of God. In uh, the Gospel of Luke, uh, these undignified outcasts to whom Jesus particularly came to proclaim deliverance are represented by the afflicted, then considered too uncomfortably unclean to be part of the people of God, sinners, then considered too indifferent to their moral code to be part of the people of God, and tax collectors, considered traitors to the people of God by dalliance with the enemy, the Romans. In Luke's Acts of the Apostles, the prophetic baton is passed on to Jesus and his followers. And the list of undignified outcasts for whom the message of deliverance is particularly fruitful includes all of the above, the afflicted, sinners and tax collectors. And added to that, we can include eunuchs, originally considered too sexually ambiguous to be part of the people of God. Samaritans, originally considered to engage with another religion to be part of the people of God. And that Samaritan religion was hated. And finally, Gentiles, originally considered too foreign to be part of the people of God. It's an interesting list, isn't it? One that is surprisingly not far from our own landscape where racism, religious intolerance and homophobia are alive and well in society. And now the baton of the prophecy, the foretelling of Christ's deliverance, is passed on to us. Jesus' followers in our day. Deliverance, let us remind ourselves, from evil, injustice and death wrought by the triumph of love and justice and eternal life in Christ's resurrection from the dead. Luke is communicating to us today that we should identify the seeds of resurrection outside our normally identified barriers uh, or boundaries of the people of God and champion those seeds of resurrection and build community around it. Even, if appropriate, invite it to operate within our church buildings and nurture it until it grows to such a radiance that it illuminates its source. Another church I was involved with along the way was St Paul's in Cambridge, who made a radical response in this respect after assessing uh, the wider needs of their uh, particular community. They literally converted the church into a church and inclusive community centre after a, a big programme of community consultation and fundraising. The scale and scope of this project, well, it isn't for every church, but it is instructive and it is inspiring, so aspects of it may well be motivational to us. What particularly struck me when I was there was the integration of the spiritual and the temporal. There were and are services of varying kinds every day, often merging into a meal of some kind and then merging into a community group, each one deliberately imparting their all-are-welcome mission ethos. 
An example uh, would be their Monday, Monday evening simple supper service, where people from the local community, the congregation, and those who are homeless or are in food poverty gather for a simple meal and listen to each other's stories. Once this is drawn to a close and cleared away, a short service in the chapel is held where candles are lit for people and situations uh, those attending are concerned about. This integration of the spiritual and the temporal, which is both comforting and thought-provoking, seems to pervade the whole building and its activities. So, for example, there is the St Paul's Curry Night, which includes a simple scripture reading and discussion between the pop doms and the maids. Then there is the Wednesday Addiction Group, which explores spirituality and well-being with people who are in recovery from addictions that include drugs and alcohol and gambling and pornography. The church singing group uh, take part in the Thursday Lunch Club for vulnerable adults. The LGBT plus group meets regularly around food to discuss ways of making the church more inclusive to LGBT plus people and so on. Now, no church is perfect, and St Paul's would be very quick to admit their failings, as well as their positive mission work. But the examples I have just relayed to you do suggest a deep listening to the scriptures. Remember, Luke is communicating to us today that we should identify the seeds of resurrection outside our normally identified boundaries of the people of God and champion those seeds of resurrection and build community around it, even if appropriate, invite it to operate within our church buildings and nurture it until it grows to such a radiance that it illuminates its source. Where might we and our churches be being led into mission as we look forward to a fresh season of being church for the community post lockdown. Lord, guide us to be fruitful in this new season of hope. Amen. And now we come to our creed where we state what we believe. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? 
I believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, God, that your love for us is constant and we can depend on your character and follow the example of your Son, Jesus. Thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide and sustain us. Help each of us take responsibility to develop our spirit with the support of the church. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. As we develop these fruits in our souls, may we be gifted to contribute to a better world. Help each of us embrace good choices to bring about the miracle of improvement for individuals, communities and the environment. Thank you Lord for the scientists and professionals who tend our earthly minds and bodies. May society equally value and support the church ministers trained in caring and shepherding our souls, which are both earthly and eternal. Thank you that you supply new bodies for our souls when they pass into the next world. May the goodness of the church continue to grow, providing solution to all circumstances. Let us rejoice that equally we all have the opportunity to take part in the good message and action of your church, which you love and bless. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you.
now we come to the blessing. May Christ, who out of defeat brings new hope and a new future, fill you with his new life. Amen. With the risen life of Christ within us, we go in the peace of Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.